Mario, would you would you like to start our um, Yes, okay, so let me uh, introduce myself. I'm the director of the Stichting ECRES Foundation with uh, sets established to bring its diverse activities together. I am uh, actually an art historian specialized in art since the 1960s and I worked for well, something like 35 years in the State Museum in Amsterdam organizing exhibitions. And uh, I wrote a lot of text on all those artists I worked with. I also shared a large part of my life with Seth and was especially involved in putting together the textile collection. After Seth died, I put together a board of editors to realize this book with collected text. Seth and I had vaguely talked about the possibility to make such a collection of writings, but he never had the time or the interest to really do so. So it seemed appropriate to me to realize this project. And uh, I want to thank uh, Keith and Margaret of Printed Matter for hosting this event. And before we discuss the book, I want to thank the Terra Foundation for American Art and the College Art Association for supporting this project through an international publication grant and many others including those who knew and worked with us like Paula Cooper, Lucy Lippert, Lawrence and Alice Wiener, Anne Goldstein and Christopher Williams and especially Jack Wendler. We also want to thank our fellow editor Mar Sarah Martinetti who will be organizing future events in Europe and also the designer of the book, Mark Hollenstein, who did a fantastic job. And then Koenig Books and Art Books, they are paid for bringing this publication to the world. And of course, James Hoff for joining us. Uh, I'm Joe Melvin. Um, I'm going to introduce myself. I um, met uh, Seth Sieglau through Peter Townsend, who was the editor of Studio International magazine and um, I became first acquainted with Seth's work through Studio International magazine as a student going through the old issues with a considerable degree of excitement and then in the early 90s I found myself working on Peter Townsend's archive and with Peter himself I met Seth on a number of occasions beginning in the 90s and then throughout um, and like Peter uh, Seth's whole attitude combined with humour and going for what he described, what they both described as going for, to the horse's mouth mm -hmm. was something that was a kind of fundamental influence on my approach to thinking and my approach to curatorial work. Uh, I'm Lauren Van Heften Schick. I'm a curator and a PhD candidate at Cornell University, and I'm uh, currently a predoctoral fellow at the Smithsonian American Art Museum. And my dissertation is focused on the origins and afterlives of one of Seth's best known projects, the Artist Reserved Rights Transfer and Sale Agreement of 1971, uh, which, like many other projects, we'll show you images of in a bit. Um, and I, maybe I'll just say something personal too. So I, I had the real pleasure of working with Seth. Um, as a research assistant um, sh shortly before he passed in 2011 to 12, working on uh, a later project he did related to art law uh, and some of his other activities for his um, personal archive on his website. And uh, Seth really became a mentor, a friend, and I, I, yeah, it just feels very good to, to do this research on his work, on his life, and also to feel to have a personal connection with someone who you really admire and appreciate on the most human level as well, um, which I really hope will come out um, more and more over the course of this conversation. Hi everyone, I'm James Hoff. Um, I'm an artist and also a co-founder and editor at Primary Information. Um, Seth was, uh, I should say, like Primary Information, as, as Keith noted, uh, was named after uh, Seth's work um, and a particular notion that he articulated around conceptual art. And Seth was very much in our minds very early on when we founded Primary Information in 2006. And uh, it was shortly thereafter that we got in touch with him and he became an early supporter of the organization and we worked together on a number of projects, uh, which we'll talk a little bit about later. Great. Thank you. Um, 
So now we're going to shift into introducing Seth's career um, and highlighting some aspects of the book. Um, and then we'll move into a conversation, um, speaking with James some more too about primary information. And then uh, later in the hour, we'll move to the Q&A. So I'm going to share my screen and cross my fingers that it works, <laughs> as always. Um, Okay. Oh, sorry, everyone. Great. It did. Beautiful. Isn't it amazing when things happen the way you want them to? Okay. <laughs> so here's the book. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> um, so, a banner at the top of Seth Siegelob's online archive, egressfoundation.net, introduced the constellation of his intellectual pursuits and personal philosophy highlighted a professional and creative passions, contemporary art, textile research, etc., motivated by impulses towards rethinking, questioning, collecting, drawing a kind of equivalence between all spheres of his activity as he was shaped by a spirit of collaboration and generosity. Um, while impossible to summarize, his, this list offers a kind of index to his interest in international networks, democratic access, and his evolving inquiry into communication as subject and medium, which led him to turn his attention to the labor, legal, market, and material histories that underpin the flow of information and objects. Before his well-known activities in conceptual art from 1964 to 66, Seth operated a gallery in Seth Siegelob Contemporary Art on 56th Street in Midtown Manhattan, and which for a time combined uh, exhibiting and trying to sell anyway, uh, rugs as well, um, and, and books from his early collection on textiles. Uh, there he presented solo exhibitions by Lawrence Wiener and a range of group shows, including The Ambitious 25 with Ad Reinhardt, Louise Nevelson, John Chamberlain, and many others. And here, Seth. If in, I would say Seth instead of Siegel up, it's just what it is. Uh, indication um, of catalog and exhibition is already apparent that the corner of that poster actually opens up to be a little booklet. Um, but as Siegelob often recalled, business was poor and he found the day in and day out scheduling of running a gallery unfulfilling and uh, this little image of him just like cutting up and playing with his catalogs, I think while just bored <laughs> in the gallery. <laughs> There's some, some, some things up. <laughs> uh, in the following years, Siegelob would go on to experiment with different forms of exhibition and collaboration with patrons and artists, as in the exhibition of Robert Berry, Carl Andre, and Lawrence Wiener of Outdoor Works at Wyndham College in Putney, Vermont in spring 1968. The exhibition was a kind of revelation for Siegelob and the artists, showing him that you don't need a gallery to show ideas. From February 1968 to July 1971, Siegelob produced 21 exhibitions in the United States, Canada, and Europe, for which he developed formats that were exemplary um, of a democratized vision of art and would forever alter the accepted ways exhibitions could manifest. Most notable uh, were his, his catalog exhibitions that allowed conceptual art to be communicated, as he, as he would say, quickly, cheaply, and easily in print media and which showcased the work of Robert Berry, Douglas Hubler, Joseph Kasuth, and Lawrence Wiener, among many other artists. As Seth explained, the catalog or his catalogs could now act as primary information for his exhibitions, as opposed to secondary information about art in magazines, et cetera. And in some cases, the exhibition could be the catalog. So that what circulates is not merely photographs of you know, an artwork, but the work itself. This was, really epitomized in the catalog exhibition, January 5 to 31, 1969, where works were installed by Wiener, Kasuth, and Barry were merely samples of how the works could be realized. And then the catalog, listing eight works by each artist contained the primary information of each work and the show overall. Siegelob was also one of the first curators to explore the potential of multi-sided or, or network exhibitions, as in his projects March 1969, in which 31 artists were asked to submit an idea for work on each day of the month. Um, and here's a draft letter where he's still determining which artists he wanted to invite for the show, uh, which includes Hannah Darboven, who wasn't included, but we wanted to make sure she was here. They were very good friends 
um, and did work together. Um, uh, and these are pages of the inside of the catalog. Um, you see artists who were invited but did not submit anything. We're just given a blank page or just left with a blank page. And um, Joe, there's a funny story behind the Flanagan piece here. I don't know if you want to say. Yes, <laughs> yes. Yeah, um, Barry Flanagan was, was, the, was the artist who responded to the idea of, of copyright and ownership by annotating by annotating the letter that he received from Seth Sieglau with the with the answers to what are the, the questions, the provocations, mm -hmm. and who owns it, who owns the work. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Sort of a nice spin on the you know, property issues in conceptual art generally. And um, I, like the way, I like the way it's beca it becomes tidied up. The letter from, from Flanagan was in fact all over the place and it must have been quite hard for for Seth Siegel out to decipher what he'd actually written. Yeah, exactly, exactly. It's a nice sort of call and response that echoes through a number of the of the projects too. Um, or like this one, for example, July, August, September, 1969, which took place throughout Europe and the Americas within a given period of time, so over these three months, and which could be encountered as a whole only through collected documentation in print. The catalog was also Seth's first trilingual uh, publication, marking his interest in international networks again and communication beyond art centers. Um, and here, just for example, is a work by Dibbets uh, tracing you know, um, uh, marks on a map and a, a traveled path with photographs, or Solowitz's installation of a wall drawing at the home of uh, uh, dealer Conrad Fisher. Um, which is this kind of nice marking of, of again, this sort of international network of collaboration between all of these artists and also dealers and other curators. Um, or this, uh, another of Siegelab's projects from the same time, his untitled exhibition at Simon Fraser University, which highlights this interest in a sort of different way through a symposium by telephone uh, between Burnaby, which is just outside Vancouver, Ottawa and New York. Um, the, and the transcript of this is, is one of the many um, interviews or discussions that's published here in the book for the very first time. Although it's very funny because a lot of the conversation is just talking about how bad the connection is. So <laughs> it's timely in the way we didn't expect it would be. <laughs> um, uh, for the July, August, 1970 issue of Studio International, Siegelab invited a network of critics and curators to fill a special section of the magazine with artists they invited, including Lucy Lepard, who asked Ankawara and Sala Witt, among others, to participate. And there's their exchange. Uh, and Michel Clara, who filled his entire section with a work by Danielle Buren. Um, and Joe, also, I know you've done a lot of research on this, on this issue. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's, very, it's very, very interesting how how it was through this project that um, Peter Townsend and Seth Sieglau became such firm friends. And when, mm -hmm. when Seth Sieglau wrote to Peter about his idea for citing, the, um, the, citing this publication as an exhibition within the magazine as a sort of, as a, as a standalone publication, mm -hmm. Townsend was so excited by the idea that he said, no, why don't you work on these actual pages themselves so that it's, within the binding of the magazine. And it's, very, it's a very nice uh, story about how closely they were connected with each other when, um, when Seth Sieglau left uh, London after staying nearby the offices of Studio International in, in, a, in, in a sort of cheap hotel for six weeks or so. He left his hat mm -hmm. in Townsend's editorial office and Townsend wrote him a letter saying, your hung hat is a constant reminder of your presence. And mm -hmm. I, I like the fact that the hat features, which was always something that Seth was inseparable from, hats. Yeah. The story doesn't relate whether he got his hat back. <laughs> yeah, the, the wearer of many hats and collector and weaver of <laughs> many hats, <laughs> in a way. Um, I keep moving. Um, in In... 1970, uh, Seth also began his exit from the art world. Uh, and in the context of uh, anti-government protest against the Vietnam War and the activism of the Art Workers Coalition, his interest in artist rights also grew. 
In late 1970, he began drafting and mailing a questionnaire to his network of artists, dealers, curators, uh, and lawyers and accountants, uh, and others to gather input on what could be included in a standard contract that would grant artists ongoing rights in their works. And in early 1971, Sigalov partnered with lawyer Robert Projansky to create the Artist Reserve Rights Transfer and Sale Agreement, which gives artists resale royalties, um, among many other rights, um, uh, and actually, which many artists did continue to, to either use or, or revise and use today, too. And of course, in line with Stigalov's acumen for publicity, it was very, very widely circulated. Um, Stigalov's public activities soon evolved beyond art towards media and political theory, although art and politics of access remained a core interest. A series of proposals for a public press and news network served as a bridge between his curatorial method of dissemination and his increasing dedication to critical leftist communication studies. In 1972, Sigalov by now really had left the art world and moved to the red town of Benoulet just outside Paris. In 1973, he founded the International Mass Media Research Center, the IMMRC, an accessible research library operating out of his home and up so a, a nearby storage unit. Uh, the collection was cataloged and publicized in a series of bibliographies on Marxism and the mass media, which also listed other texts of interest to solicit their donation to the library and to disseminate information on the field and throughout the field. The bibliographies were produced under Siegelob's imprint International General, which between 1973 and 1991 published 13 books on Marxist and communication theories, including new monographs, edited collections, and new translations of international writings. Materials in the collection range from conference papers to posters and other ephemera, uh, again, really forming a kind of horizontality between the items that constitute political or, or cultural history. Um, through the late 1980s, Siegelob's interests again moved elsewhere, to the social history of handwoven textiles and to Amsterdam where he, re where he relocated. He established the Center for Social Research on Old Textiles, which comprised a specialty library and a collection of textiles and headdresses. And in 1997, International General published the Bibliographica, I can never say this right, Bibliographica Textilia Historiae. The first general- That's anyway, uh, very strange the title, so it's okay to not be just to made it up. <laughs> we wanted it to sound very academic. It does. <laughs> very much resonates with his sense of humor. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> it does. <laughs> um, is the first uh, general bibliography on the subject and, and really it actually is a very key resource for the field now. Um, and as with his previous bibliographies, the indexing and classification system was devised by Siegelob himself and it listed items both in and relevant to his collection. Um, yet, I mean, this whole, the, there's something really funny though about the narrative of Siegelob leaving the art world because of course, <laughs> He always circles back in. Um, and uh, in 2004, actually, the culmination of a years long project with dealers Marianne and Roswitha Frick was finally published, titled The Context of Art, The Art of Context, for which artists participating in major conceptual art exhibitions were invited to reflect on their history and developments in art since. And I am just going to flag this project because this is a very, I think, underappreciated. Um, uh, effort of Seth's and um, it, it's it's surprising to me that it's, it doesn't circulate more or isn't better known um, and, so, and we can certainly talk about it. Um, in 2011, Siegelob produced another project reflecting on, as it was titled, uh, How Is Art History Made? Investigating the social and internal political mechanisms behind art. Uh, in this time, Siegelob also returned to his interest in artist legal issues and artist rights, developing with art lawyer and curator Daniel McLean, the Egress Art Law Center. Uh, so as Maria said too, Siegelob often reflected on the history he had been a part of and um, in 1990 began drafting plans for a book of his writings and interviews and other materials for which he chose the title Better Red Than Dead. Um, this spelled a little funny. 
Um, and in 2011, Sikolob's collections of textiles and books on textiles were made publicly accessible as a database um, hosted at egressfoundation.net. This is the new website where these databases are live again. Um, in 1990 and 2019, the archive and collection of the IMMRC were donated to the International Institute for Social History in Amsterdam. And in 2011, the papers for his years in conceptual art were acquired by the Museum of Modern Art in New York. And in 2012, of course, Primary Information worked with Siegelob to distribute PDFs of many of his conceptual art projects. Um, and here is Seth modeling some things uh, from his textile collection. Um, Mario, maybe you can tell us a little bit more about these. these well, two. I was thinking a lot of the textiles were acquired during our travels. Mm -hmm. So here on the uh, right, you see him in an, uh, a coat of a priest uh, from Korea. It's a very kind, a special kind of textile, sort of padded and stitched through. And I always thought it very funny that he would buy those things and actually wear them, go around town dressed like that. The other one is on the roof of our house. Well, you can see that Seth really liked Amsterdam. And the hat he has on is uh, African. It's a ceremonial hat for a chief of a tribe and the feathers are uh, artificially dyed and the thing can fold so you can carry it around like a little uh, basket and said normally uses ma mother as a model but I took this photograph because I thought he uh, well it looked too good on him mm -hmm. so yes <laughs> And the textiles were presented in a few exhibitions, actually, but uh, really this fabulous one at Raven Row is very huge. It was, was this the entire collection, Maria? No, it was just a selection. And it actually started because Alex Sainsbury had asked Seth, Seth if he could do something with conceptual art. And Seth thought about it and then decided that he really didn't want to do that because it was yeah, part of his life. And of course, he still was friends with a lot of the artists he worked with. But it wasn't his main interest at that point. And he proposed to Alex to do something with the textile collection. And Alex agreed to that. And it forced set to well really start a workshop so we could look at all those different textiles which had been in our house and hidden under the bed and under the roof you know everywhere you would look you would see some kind of I don't know a headdress a little chasuble or other things and anyway so set a cotton um a curator to really work on it and make the things presentable and this was then uh, shown in Raven Row of course the stand with the headdresses is very striking but the exhibition went through the whole building and, and like every room had its own theme so here you see uh, on the left wall the tapas which was something uh, said particularly liked and which really it has a lot to do with contemporary art because if you see look at the drawings you can recognize Recognize, like uh, for me, Dutch Jan Schoonhoven, for example, or Michaud. So there's a similarity, and Seth was always looking for similarities in cultures. Mm -hmm. And another reason why he was so fascinated by all the textiles is he just liked the beauty of it. And as Lauren already mentioned, when he had his um, gallery in New York, he tried to become uh, a carpet dealer also. He never really managed to do that, but he was always is very interesting carpets but why they are not part of the collection and why they are not really in the bibliography is that carpets is like a special uh, chapter and there's so much interest in it that I can't compete with it I want to do something different and I think that's one of the core thoughts of his whole life that he wanted to do something different and move on if needed mm -hmm. and at the bottom here you see um, the inventory sheets of the textile collection which is actually very nice I think because you can see that sometimes he used photographs he made drawings and he made very uh, careful descriptions of uh, things mm -hmm. and then this this kind of then, um, at a certain point I uh, wrote this proposal for several museums so the Stedelijk Museum was the one which accepted it to make a big exhibition on him and uh, combining let's say the three chapters. So the conceptual art, the politics and the textiles. 
And I asked uh, Sarah Martinetti to uh, co-curate because she was writing her PhD on SES and she actually knew a lot of things I didn't know. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's different when you live with somebody and you are part of it. I never went uh, so mm -hmm. into yeah. research. I mean, I was just was just my life. But anyway, and then the state curator, Leontine Koulemey, also uh, participated. The idea to show yeah. The uh, textiles all uh, horizontally is really came from Seth because one thing which I've an anecdote is in the 1970s I made an exhibition of Navajo blankets so Native Americans and I uh, did that because I had been talking to Barnett Newman and Ellsworth Kelly so I came to see those things just through the eyes of painters and I had them installed on the walls in the Stedelijk and like 25 years later Seth said to me yeah it was nice that you made that exhibition but you really did a terrible job because you put all those textiles on the wall just like if they are paintings but textile is not a painting you should have understood that well <laughs> okay <laughs> I, I I do understand actually what he said so that was yeah. really the idea behind uh, showing all these things horizontally yeah. and well you and see we, here, you yeah know, we, should, we should note too that the the Raven Row exhibition, oh, I'm sorry, Raven Row exhibition was also curated by Sarah Martinetti, um, along with uh, Alice Motard and, Ingl and Alex Sainsbury from Raven Row. Um, and then just briefly, you can see in the state of like exhibition also included uh, sections about all of uh, Seth's conceptual art projects. There's a, there was a funny remake of the January show, uh, Office Space, uh, Maria Eichhorn's, uh, artist Maria Eichhorn's project on the artist contract was in, it included in a smaller version. Um, and then those are books from the IMMRC collection. Um, so, you know, as we were thinking about just you know, Seth as a figure, as someone we all knew, and as um, how we w wanted to just frame this whole project, um, I think for all of us, the, this network that sort of developed around not, I don't want to even say around Seth, but that he was really a part of and the people that he worked with um, really in, in those relationships really emerged as important. Um, so I just wanted to land on this quote. Um, uh, the conceptual art was not something I made up myself. It grew up out of my personal economic situation, which was extremely modest compared with other peoples in the art world, out of the nature of the work that was produced by the artists with whom I was working. And it was it, that it was a symbiosis of these two elements, this type of collaborative and complementary relationship um, is still at the base of my work today. And I hope it always will be. And uh, we think it has been. <laughs> um, yeah. So with that, I mean, um, maybe we should turn to um, to one of the more recent uh, or, and other uh, collaborators with Seth. Um, I don't know if, uh, if Joe, you wanna say a few words too, um, and James about the origins of your uh, working with Seth. Yeah, I, I'd, like to, I'd like to ask James a, a question. Um, and uh, I, I remember coming across primary information very early on. Um, and and finding through communication with you how many downloads there were of Seth Siegelau's publications within literally the first few days. And what I'd like to ask you is uh, if you could t tell us something about how you went about this collaboration with with Seth Siegelau. Had you met him, or was it this all all done through through e email communication? Uh, a little bit of both. Uh, it started with email. Uh, we had uh, approached him. See, uh, Primary Formation was started in 2000, it was founded in 2006. Yeah. Uh, our first publication was in 2007. So uh, somewhere in there, probably in 2007, we emailed him um, to see, well, I should also preface by saying that part of Primary, Primary Formation's mission is to publish facsimile editions of artist books that are out of print um, yet are still relevant to contemporary conversations. And we emailed him in 2007 or thereabouts to see if he would allow us to publish facsimile editions of some of the catalogs he had produced in the late 60s. And 
uh, he politely said no, uh, but in a way that sort of like opened up a conversation that we began. And um, a little bit later, we were we were discussing the idea of PDFs, and it hadn't quite hadn't quite sort of fomented at that point, but. We were asked to do uh, to curate a room at PS1 for an exhibition called That Was Then and This Is Now, and that was in 2009. And uh, we decided uh, to devote our room to the Art Workers Coalition. Um, Seth was very much involved with uh, with the AWC, so we asked him if we could also um, publish PDFs of the artist contract on in all four languages to accompany the exhibition as a free download. And uh, he said, yes. And I think throughout the course of that exhibition, the PDFs were maybe downloaded around 20,000 or 25,000 times. It was pretty, yeah, pretty, pretty notable. Pretty um, and that began, or at least sort of like exacerbated another conversation around these publications from the late sixties. Um, and Seth eventually said, or, pretty quickly thereafter actually said that we could reprint them um, or we could publish them as PDFs um, that we couldn't do with them as physical copies, but we could do them as PDFs for, and we could only make them available for free uh, as downloads on our website. And he went a little bit further and then said, um, you know, I know that you're young and you're trying to raise money to, you know, fund the organization and also to fund this online resource that you're trying to put together. And so he gave us a donation and helped us sort of build out that part of our website, which is obviously still there. And it took a few years for us to, um, to get those PDFs in order, essentially to find them. Seth ended up um, actually loaning several of them to us because they're just too, as everyone knows, anyone knows who's tried to find these publications are very valuable. Part of what necessitated, um, or for us, like prompted the need to, re, to, to get them back out into the world. And um, in 2012, we launched uh, six of them. Um, and that was the one that was like that launch, I think within the first week, there was maybe 100,000 downloads of those publications in total. And the most of them were, I think there was over 50,000 downloads of the Xerox book. Mm -hmm. And um, that's pretty incredible. I mean, 20,000 for the, for, the, for the contract was pretty incredible for us. I mean, we're used to producing books and editions of a thousand, two thousand, three thousand, if you're really lucky. So um, to see that kind of need um, and to see that kind of interest and demand for this work uh, was pretty eye-opening for us um, initially. And then when we published all of them together and there was this huge sort of, um, there was this just huge reception for the work itself. It was, it was pretty, it was pretty eye-opening. And, and um, I know that Seth was, was definitely was definitely into that aspect of it as were as were we. Well, he was definitely extremely excited about the about the shift of platform and the, and the availability of these of these publications for free and yeah. so many of them, which is a kind of fundamental concern of of yeah. that distribution network. Yeah, and it was something that this was something that I didn't realize until I was actually reading reading uh, your book, which was that. Um, in this interview with Jonathan Monk, he was talking about how he would he would give these publications away for free at certain points, and then That's right, yeah. and then he would you know when it became, I think there was at some point there was this transformation where this material, SES material, but also a lot of the publications from that period there they became quite valuable, and uh, then he he sort of transformed. And, and he didn't really give them away for free, but he encouraged people to photograph or to photocopy them and then to uh, disperse them that way. So mm -hmm. um, it felt very much in line with, with the, the PDF feels very much in line with that progression for sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, with that whole ethos. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And of course there was, there was the, um, the idea that we would continue to do more and more as time went on. And that has sort of like that sort of, has stopped, of course, um, with us passing. But um, but yeah, it is good to see. It's good to see those publications still sort of actively being downloaded and and uh, used from our website for sure. So mm -hmm. yeah, I I think in a way, you know, if if Seth was just been you know if you'd been born a few decades later, you know, I could easily see him making things online primarily actually I and mean, he was just very, so interested in 
in these, how many, in, in, in making however possible, like these things accessible and able to circulate and widely open. Um, and so it was more about like the venues and means for doing that, like with that as the end. Um, does, does anyone know, um, just generally speaking, SUS reception to the internet as it became more widely available in the 80s and 90s? And I mean, he must have been, with someone being so interested in communication systems and communication networks and distribution networks and distributed systems, he must have been, I'm, I'm assuming, very interested in that development. Does anyone know? Has anyone ever talked to him about yes, that? he was. <laughs> and he, he published actually... Uh, his later catalogs on textiles only on the internet. No, I mean, in the beginning, I told him how to use the computer and within a few weeks, he was better at it than I was. So it was really, I mean, he just had the kind of mind to understand it. And, and he found it interesting to experiment and find out new things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and he made his own online archive of his work and career, um, which is really pretty impressive, I have to say. I mean, in, but it was always sort of very interested in how, you know, how to connect information. I, even one of the things, and, and actually a number of people worked with him as, as always, a number of people worked with him on that art lab um, project. But one of the things that it included was a bibliography of, you know, books on this subject, but also links to other websites. And he was just very interested in, in this format of, of the website on the internet and in, yeah. in just like the ease of connecting uh, not just information and people making things accessible, but like connecting libraries to each other, rethinking what a library does and can be. Um, and that is a theme that I think really runs from you know his work in the early 70s throughout his life too. You know, having a research center, you know, in your house, like what a fabulous idea <laughs> that people really actively use. Um, yeah, it's very inviting. Actually, inviting yeah. people to to participate and to respond and to handle whether they're handling it literally online by how they're facilitating their movements around the space, or mm -hmm. whether they're handling the actual publications in the library, the resource of the library, it's a it's a sort of fundament to to his approach. This connecting between people and always very quick, quickly connecting all these people together in a way that is incredibly generous and robust. And it's something that, that, that it, it sort of um, continues in the kind of meta thinking for the publication to keep afloat all these diversities within the, within the orchestration of Seth's actual project. And I think <laughs> that that's, you know, that's what we were, we were doing or trying to do in the, in the production of the book. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because Seth really, he, um, I read many times where he claimed he was not a writer and did not want to be a writer and would never write again. And, um, and uh, I think that was one of the questions. I mean, there's, there's such a diversity of, of uh, forms that are happening in the book and uh, obviously spans a lot of subjects and a lot of years. Um, but I was curious, I was curious about a couple of things. One was I, I actually didn't know about the memoirs. Um, and I wasn't, I wasn't, I was curious as to how, how sort of complete they were. Um, I know it's like a memoirs, it's a memoir about writing a memoir, is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, it's, a, it's a hilarious text. <laughs> so, so this was written really in, in Seth's sort of moment of in leaving the art world, um, 1970, sort of think, reassessing the work that he'd done to that point. Uh, who his network was, but but also really very interested in how the publishing industry works and how these kind of channels of access work. So there's this fantastic exchange um, that he writes about in the memoir. So which is which is really it's it's a book about publishing a book. So I should just back up and say that part of the transcript for the men for part part of the manuscript of the memoir is sort of somewhat more personal reflection. None of it personal life details, but you know there is just some personal thinking through. Um, of you know the bigger stakes of his work, but but the idea for it also is that it's a book about publishing a book. So there's this very funny sort of account of you know um, Seth, 
who is like trying to get the book published for an unknown writer, but who is really Seth, you know, visiting publishers' offices, getting rejected, and then like getting legal advice from his lawyer, Gerald Ordover, and then like getting lunch and then going back to the publisher. And, but, but it really becomes very much about, um, again, I do think this sort of theme of access um, it's a big part of it and him just sort of becoming very interested in like what what is this what is this um dissemination network that he is a part of through his catalog exhibitions and then how does it really operate at, at these other levels and from the publishing side and and who you know who are gatekeepers but also not in a non um I don't want to say non-critical but but really like in a way that comes from like serious curiosity about the way that these networks and systems kind of operate um, and wanting to show that through this text then too. And it's much longer. I think in the book, we only included an excerpt of around six pages, the mm -hmm. uh, actual text. Um, actually, I don't remember how long it is right now, I, it, but it's, it's, it's far longer, far, far, far longer. Uh, and that's in, in his archives at MoMA. And so the book, the book itself, in terms of him, in, in terms of him, um, sort of idealizing or sort of setting, I mean, thinking about it or planning it, but never getting around to finishing it. How much, how much of the book was actually, was actually, how much did Seth actually work on the book? Not uh, at all. Not at all. Just got the bit. All. No, no, it was just something he sometimes talked about. And when I retired from the state, like I proposed to him that I would start uh, on this project. He said, no, 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 no. So, <laughs> I mean, it was more like an idea floating around. And maybe if he had had time, he would have done it. But it definitely was not um, something he was focusing on. He was really more interested in his textiles and so at that moment and in house art history made. I think he regretted very much that he didn't have time enough to do something more with that. And he always hoped that somebody else would pick it up and continue. So it is more than the collected writing. Yes, a good idea, but somebody else will do it. Mm -hmm. Something like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you started you started from the ground up, essentially. Yeah, but that's why I needed a board of editors because I didn't think I could do it by myself. So I was very happy to find Sarah, Laura, and, and Joe. Mm -hmm. Well, prepared to get really involved. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think too, it's it's so. I was thinking about this earlier, like there's something that's so, I think so exciting about someone who has a career like Seth's where he taps into so many different fields and frankly leaves such a gigantic paper trail. <laughs> His archives are quite overwhelming and, and, and actually very, in a very good way. <laughs> like it's, it's amazing um, how much material there is, which is I think a very exciting thing for researchers and for curators too, who are interested in this subject because there's just so many projects to look back at and so many angles, you know, through which you could look at his work. And um, it, it, because it overlaps with so many different fields, um, it's of interest to so many people and, and, and really encourages kind of cross-disciplinary work. And again, in a way that I, I can only use the word generous for, um, but I think that's, that's a very exciting thing about it. And so it requires multiple people, <laughs> I think, to make a book about it. <laughs> yeah. And the work is quite dispersed as well. I mean, I know there's stuff at MoMA. I mean, obviously the archive is at MoMA, but there must have been other stuff that you're pulling from different sources, I assume. Is that true? Yeah. Um, so his papers having to do with the IMMRC are now, again, all at the Institute, uh, International Institute for Social Research in um, history, uh, history. History. What did I say? Oh, I'm sorry. History. <laughs> it's I'm a sorry. History. <laughs> history. The University of Amsterdam. Yes. <laughs> it's quite a mouthful. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, so those are all there now, um, in addition to the library and collection. Uh, and, and by the library, it's not just books, it's also sort of articles and clippings that he collected. It's sort of all mix of things. Um, and there's, of course, the material at MoMA. There's actually quite a fair amount of material that hasn't gone to a formal archive yet, which, which you still have, Maya. 
<laughs> yeah, I'm well, it's <laughs> all at storage because, of course, this is a whole library on textiles and the textile collection itself and all his notes about it. And I've been looking for a place, but, but that's not easy. So I haven't achieved mm -hmm. that problem. So it's mostly in storage and hardly accessible, which makes it also complicated. Although I have at the moment two little shows here in Amsterdam at the Kunstverein and at uh, Tilde Art Space, where I show some of uh, that stuff and also some of the political publications. So I know there is interest with, for that whole textile collection. You really need a bigger institution to uh, want to take care of it. And said already was trying to... Uh, do that when he was still alive. He was totally prepared to don donate it to a, a museum. Mm -hmm. But and I, I haven't had any positive responses or uh, things are very complicated, it seems. Mm. Mm -hmm. Well, we can all hope that all of this work will just keep, you know, feeding more interest in and catching oh them. yes, definitely, because the exhibitions we have made with the textiles and books are really very successful. Mm -hmm. So I mean, it's, it is, and you can see that actually in contemporary art that the interest in textiles is growing. There's so many artists using it and doing interesting things with it. And said, of course, also because he didn't just uh, collect European textiles, but was really very interested in the crossovers of cultures. So there's a lot of Chinese stuff and African and Latin America and I think that's really what's happening in the art world all over that all those other parts outside of Europe become well more in the center and Seth was really already doing that for years mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah I was sort of curious I, I remember I was at the I was at the panel discussion at MoMA in 2007 I believe and Seth had had discussed briefly about he briefly discussed the textiles um, or just what he was working on the textiles. And he also mentioned the, the, the physics and time um, yeah. as well. And I was curious as to what, cause, cause um, the textiles have been very present, I think um, through exhibitions. And I was, I was wondering about the physics and time uh, uh, the collection or was he putting together an archive or a bibliography? Yes, he was collecting books and yes, uh, trying to make an archive. But yeah. the problem with it is that a lot of these books have been published in very uh, large editions. So there's nothing that special in it. And with Texas, for example, he had a lot of 16th century uh, pamphlets and books, which makes it much more valuable. And um, I've actually given that whole library to an art historian who is going to do something with it someday. But and I thought that's the best thing to do because I mean, I can't keep all that stuff myself and I'm not really into that subject and to have found somebody who did, will do something. And for example, uh, Mario Garcia Torres made that uh, film on it uh, for, during the exhibition in the state, like, really using that or playing with that idea. So I know there is some interest in it, but it just needs time. Somebody definitely will pick it up at a certain point. I'm wondering and, and noting that it's it's actually almost at six o'clock. Um, okay. Should we should we see if there are questions? Yeah. From attendees. Yes. Yes. Um, <clears throat> yeah, if anybody wants to put in their question now, take a moment to think about it. We have this one question that came in through YouTube, which I can read off, and I think just general to the group or anybody that may have insight, but um, to just have to write about or interact with performance, i.e. performance art or uh, theater in any way. No, I don't think so. Yeah. Not really. I mean, he would go and see it, but if he have actually was ac actively involved in it, I don't think so. Yeah, there was one exhibition at Seth Siegel at Contemporary Art that was sort of a happening um, with uh, Arnie Hinden, who I will just say I have found very little information on, and if anybody listening knows 
<laughs> that was more please get in touch um but it was a, a very sort of funny show um critiquing uh you know collector relations and the the collector class versus the artist class um but that was very very early on um but no it, it yeah it is sort of surprising in a way given his this interest in sort of other media um that there wasn't wasn't more work with performance Oh, let's see here. Um, another question here. Uh, did he ever get any critique in his collecting habits of or from uh, non-Western communities? I would guess this is relating to the textile collection. The textiles, I think, yeah. 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 Maria, do you, can you no. call anything? No, I don't really think so. No. Hmm. Or around, around. The, the things we have for provenance or it's the, the it's well documented, but no. I mean you wonder or he wondered about it too, because we have, for hmm. example, some uh, very early Chinese things which definitely comes from a grave. And um, yeah, that could be an issue. Mm -hmm. Definitely, but I mean, it, till now I've never received any complaints or questions or critiques, no. Mm -hmm. um, another question, oops. Yeah. Um, yeah. Other than Flanagan, did, or Joe, if you wanted to chime in there as well. Uh, yeah, I can't quite read all the question. Um, let me see. Uh, I can, um, I can read that one off the next one. Oh, yeah. uh, other uh, than Flanagan, yeah. did Seth have a strong interest yeah, in any other British artists? Um, uh, um, in, in, that, in that actual uh, exhibition, in the one month, there were um, Art and Language, who were mm -hmm. at that point um, uh, Terry Atkinson and Michael Baldwin and Richard Long and, and Barry. They were the ones who were who featured in the in the one month, uh, but he became friends with other artists when he came over who were part of that kind of network who involved who were involved with St Martin's like Bruce McLean for instance. When I say friends, I mean people they would meet in the pub and and, and discuss what was going on together. So yes. Um, let's have a look here. Um, another question here, it says, one thing that intrigued me about the book was that for all, oops, is this, for all of Seth's interest in the value of art and objects, it has never made clear how he funded his own activities. I think that's the second part of a question that maybe I'm missing the first part of, sorry. Mm. Um, let me read another one here. It says, are there any plans to publish any of the catalogs as exhibition books? And notes that uh, the Xerox book was published by Roma Publications. Mm -hmm. um, James, is that something maybe you? Uh, in physical form or is that, because I think Seth, at least uh, when we were in discussions together, he was very adamant that that he he far preferred the PDF. And I, I, I he's also, there's an interview that I've read recently that's in the book where he talks about uh, the idea of printing off the books and having them available for free in that capacity inside of an exhibition would is much more preferable than to having one in underneath like a, a vitrine or something like that. So I think, um, I, I think, I mean, I, I was very happy to see the, the Xerox book when Roma uh, published it just because it was nice to have one in physical form, but um but there's no plans by us at the moment, but um, Maria, is there, is there anything? Yes, well, um, so I know that Seth wasn't really in favor of it. And that Book of Roma, of course, I had to think about it a long time if I was going to do it or not. But then I noticed that there's so much interest in it. And I did it on purpose during the exhibition at the state, like, because that's, I thought that's then a moment that it makes sense, because I'm not really going to uh, republish all those old catalogs. I, yeah. 
then I prefer the PDF too. But I mean, for example, I have asked Lorenz Wiener if I could uh, make for statements again, because I think that's such an important book because um, it's really the, one of the first books of Wiener, but it's also because Seth was so enormously um, involved in the typography. And in the beginning when he had his gallery, where you can see it in a lot of those uh, mock-ups and things you see that Seth was really into typography and book designing and statements shows that a little bit. So I would like to do a reprint of that. Lawrence wasn't particularly interested. And then I thought, well, okay, if he doesn't like the idea, why should I push it? But for the rest, no, I, um, I think the PDFs are fine. <laughs> Well, I have actually made um, facsimiles of the books from the PDFs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, the state yeah. did that for the exhibition also. Yeah. We had some yeah. facsimiles exactly. because it was too expensive to borrow that from the MoMA. Yeah. <laughs> that gave a lot of my books to the MoMA together with his archive. Because yeah. he thought that that, that 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 should be as complete as possible. So, yeah. yeah. I was gonna say I'd be very happy to see this like uh, available in the world in uh, in some form yes. <laughs> accessible. Yes. Um, it's, it's a classic. I know it went through many, many, many printings, um, but um, I guess no, we the have... English not that many. It's translated in so many languages. Yeah. I actually not so long ago, say like last year, I gave a Turkish publisher the right to publish it in Turkish as a PDF. That's great. Yeah. Yeah, I thought the Turks need that. I mean, it was really good to make you aware of how capitalism works. So, yeah. um, another question here. Um, how did Seth first get involved or come to know Lucy Lepard? Hmm. I did an interview with, um, with Seth about um, this particular period uh, when he met Lucy Lippard, which actually was published in, in After All and is, does feature in, in, in the book. And they met, uh, from, from what I understand from how Seth spoke, they met through private views and, and they, they became friendly. And, and they both had a child, a small child. And so they started uh, having a conversation about these, about, about the, the little babies. It was like, it was like that through meeting. Mm -hmm. I feel like that stressed this a lot, um, uh, stressed the sort of smallness of the art world in the late sixties and also the social aspect of the art world um, and how important that social aspect was to, to the creation of work. It's, it's a fundamental yeah. network interaction with people. Um, maybe next year. Um, did Seth have any interest in locating artistic practices at the intersection of textiles and conceptual art? Or were these interests uh, completely separate? I think that's for Maya. Well. I don't know what to say. No, I don't think they were completely separate, but yeah, I don't know. There are all those moments in life that things connect, which is not always logical for every, anybody else to see the why, but for Seth, it was just one thing which led to another. And he always was, I mean, this whole story that he left the art world is of course a bit complicated also because, Although he wasn't so actively involved anymore, and it mostly had to do with the fact that it became so commercial. And yeah, he, had, he sort of thought he had done what he had to do. And then all his time was taken up by uh, all this political publishing. And so, I mean, he just moved on. But it's not that he completely lost interest. And I actually would see uh, most of the exhibitions of the people he had worked with. And he would regularly go to galleries and museums. So. He wasn't so much around as a social figure, but he, he liked to be by himself anyway. So. so you think it's also part of this kind of performative uh, persona that, he, that he, he played with, like with his very early memoirs when he was 
realizing himself as another as another Seth Seagal who's yeah. making yeah. all these connections then in this sort of alternate persona of another Seth Siegler who isn't involved in the art world anymore, but is actually able to go to private views in a dispassionate way because he's not connected to that particular group of artists. He can come in on the fly or on the sly, you know, he can come in from, from the side in a way that is actually quite different. Uh, I, I mean, I would think that the, that the interest in, in textiles has that kind of fundamental connection in its sort of intricacy and at the kind of metadata level because of the way that the thing is produced, the whole kind of rationale for its production, which was something that drove Seth's curiosity in, in the production of work and what was motivating it and where was it gonna be situated and for whom and by whom and what were the means to do that. And I think that that, is a connection which goes through everything that he collected, whether it was the time and causality or all the textiles or, or also the, 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 the literature or the Marxist literature. What are these fundaments and how do they get through to people? How do they matter and how are they realized and, and how important are they? And it's part of my responsibility to distribute them as broadly as I can to as many people as possible. But I, I think I think that for me that seems to me a kind of connection. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Shall we carry on? There's a couple more. It looks like um, <clears throat> question about uh, did Seth ever mention uh, Alexander Alberos? Conceptual art and the politics of publicity. Is that yeah, a title yeah, yeah. he knows about? I mean, he was very involved in it, and Alex, and he talks a lot. So, yes. And I think he was very happy with the book. Hmm. Yeah, those are, I'm just going to note there is an interesting exchange with an interview, um, an interview that, that Seth did with John Slice in Art Monthly, where he, that is actually about the book. Um, Seth's one one sort of comment on it or, or uh, one critique of it was that he was never really comfortable with being framed as a publicity machine um, in the way <laughs> that, that mm -hmm. the book frames him, which, you know, we could all sort of <laughs> debate uh, endlessly. Um, but yeah, it is sort of interesting though that, that he, did, he did have a problem with that characterization. Um, like being the ad man instead of <laughs> instead of the curator and collaborator, but that book is extraordinary for. Um, I mean, it's it's an extraordinary book on, on many many levels and really did kind of set in motion a huge amount of research um, on Seth and on this period. And um, you know, it's it's a fabulous resource and and anything that I ever read between uh, uh, that Seth said about it. Um, it has a huge amount of admiration for the project. That was the, uh, it was for the, the panel at MoMA that I referenced earlier was, was, uh, was to celebrate or was in relationship to that book. And mm -hmm. I believe Lawrence Wiener and Robert Berry were also on the panel. And yes. Yes. Um, that panel is archived as an audio file on MoMA's website, if anyone's interested in mm -hmm. hearing. Yeah, it's transcribed in the book also. Yeah. Um, should we take a look? Let's see. Um, uh, what do you think is Seth's legacy for the field of journalism? Hmm. Going to the horse's hmm. mouth. Yeah. <laughs> Not speaking for someone, allowing them to speak for themselves. Yeah. I mean, in a, in a way, it relates back to the sort of internet question, too, I think. Um, yeah, so, so he was looking at a lot of underground papers and there were a ton of underground papers when he was developing the Public Press and News Network project, which never really came to fruition. Um, so, but, but I, you know, I mean, maybe if there's something for journalism, it's, you know, another example perhaps of this kind of, you know, historical reflexive and, and underground like critique sort of current of journalism that existed then and that still exists now. And I think 
I mean, journalism means something totally different today than what it did in the 1970s, just by virtue of, of media. Um, there was a, a, a question earlier that sort of that we didn't, it was the one that I think only half of it came through, but it was regarding um, how Seth funded his projects, um, which I think is, is an interesting topic. I mean, just in, in terms of thinking more about his network of collaborators, I mean, he, he worked with a lot of um, collectors to help um, produce the catalogs that he made. Actually, it was, it was this, the Public Press and News Network project is what made me think about that question again, because as he was developing it, he tried to solicit funds for the newspaper by going to art collectors that he knew. So Herman Dallet, for example, um, uh, or the Grinsteins in Los Angeles. Um, and and I, there's a funny, um, there's a funny economy to these kind of publications too. Um, Cause even though, uh, you know, maybe they would be cheaper to, to produce than, you know, a big museum exhibition or something like this. A book is still not cheap. <laughs> you know, there were like hefty bills and still a lot of fundraising that needed to get done for each of these projects. One of the documents that is um, reproduced in the book is actually a solicitation for, um, funders for uh, uh, an exhibition that he did with uh, Michel, with, um, Michel Clora. Uh, well, he, he, Seth did the catalog, Clora did the exhibition uh, in Paris in 1970, which is a very, has a very good insight into how this worked. Um, and I'll, I'll say one more sort of archival anecdote too, that in the Simon Fraser University archives, their budget for the, they didn't really have an exhibition space in 1969, but the space that we're using as an exhibition space is sort of very telling of, of the, the range of, again, economy of these kinds of practices. So SFU in 1969 presented the untitled exhibition, which we showed you a slide of. And then also uh, James Warren Felter, who was directing the space, presented March or, or March 1969 or one month as an exhibition where he just put up one page for every day. So that of course was one of the cheapest exhibitions that they did. I think they, they put it down as no cost. But then the untitled exhibition was actually the most or one of the most expensive exhibitions that was produced that year. <laughs> so even given these sort of like meager, um, even given this very uh, like supposedly quick, cheap and easy output, uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that they didn't require a lot of backing in certain ways, too. Um, excellent. I think that's that's all I'm seeing at the moment for questions. I don't know if there's any from our panelists. Um, we can give it another moment and see if anything else comes through or any other thoughts that people wanted to share. Hmm. I want to say one thing because I actually think I misspoke earlier. I don't want to give him, I don't want to be misleading. I think when I mentioned Hunter Dar Darboven earlier, I said that they had worked together. What I meant to say was that they just had kind of a, an ongoing exchange. Um, which again, as I think is important to highlight, and one of the reasons why we included a draft of that letter and not the final publication version was because it has other artists who he was in contact with. And it just sheds more light on this kind of bigger network that he was really very involved in um, and stayed very involved in. Um, and again, I mean, it, it's, it's, there's something that seems, I don't wanna say contradictory, but very funny of, in a way about a book that is one person's writings and interviews, but again, what is he, what, what are all these interviews but conversations with other people, you know? And um, the fact that a lot of these, these exhibitions were so closely developed with, again, the other artists and, and even the patrons that he was in contact with um, is something that I think is, we, we wanted to come out from the book too. Um, I also wanna note that the book for people just watching, the book doesn't just have um, the interviews and the and and 
archival documents reproduced, but there also is an excellent uh, bibliography of Seth's um, lectures and, and publications and interviews, uh, which Sarah Martinetti compiled. There is a list of secondary sources on Seth Siegelab, um, which Maria and I compiled. There's an introduction uh, by myself and Joe, obviously, uh, and another preface by Sarah. Um, so it's a really, it's also a real resource too for, for going down the many, uh, uh, many paths um, of his mind. There's one other note here. Um, uh, are there any, we talked a little bit about publications. Are there any other publications or exhibitions of Seth's work that are upcoming? Hmm. Well, there's one in Amsterdam now. Two. <laughs> yeah, two, two. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, there is Seth's uh, bookstore and exhibitions uh, at the Kunstverein. But yeah, the problem, of course, is that it's yeah. closed. Mm -hmm. And then there is this exhibition at the artist space, Tilde. Um, that's uh, possible to visit when you make an appointment. Mm -hmm. And yes, I don't know, at the moment, I'm more thinking about book presentations, but I also find it a bit difficult at the moment. So I think this is nice, but um, you can't do the same thing 10 times. So I have to think about a different formula. Mm -hmm. but I, yes. Mm -hmm. Well, what do we all think? I think that takes us to the end of our questions. I see one person with their hand raised. I'm not sure how that's done, to be honest. <laughs> oh, there we go. Okay. Yeah, um, well, I think, mm -hmm. is that a note to conclude on or any other mm -hmm. final thoughts? I think I mean, it seems like it was a really wonderful, rich conversation. Everyone covered a lot of territory there. Um, thank you very much for having us. Yeah, thank, thank you. you so much, yes. Yeah, yeah, we couldn't think of, you know, better place. <laughs> like, um, oh, okay. yeah, incredible. And like, I, I haven't seen the book in person yet, but it looks, looks amazingly uh, mm -hmm. exhaustive and something to spend a lot of time with, so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and Printed Matter has books and they're in your shipping and all that stuff, Keith? Yes, absolutely, yep. Okay. Great. Well, great. And thank you all. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thanks. Have a nice Bye -bye, day. Bye, everybody. Thank you all. Bye -bye. Okay, bye-bye.